You're listening to Eric Rogel Talks with Warriors, Lovers, Kings, and Heroes, where you'll hear real stories of the journey to modern manhood told by the men who lived them. Raw, real, and 100% unapologetic. And now, here is your host, Eric Rogel. Hey, this is Eric Rogel, and thanks for joining us on Warriors, Lovers, Kings, and Heroes. This is where each week you'll hear real stories of the journey to modern manhood told by the men who live them. You can find this and previous episodes at WLKHpodcast.com. Now, we'll get to today's guest in a moment. First, I want to talk about something important. A buddy of mine sent me an article this week that was all about men taking back our masculinity. He sent it because he knows this is a subject I'm very passionate about. And the article actually got me angry. It got me fired up. Because when I really felt into the headline, take back our masculinity, what that says to me is one of two things. It either makes us complicit in giving it away, like we gave up our masculinity willingly, or we are victims for having it stolen from us, taken from us against our will. And we are not victims. We are not some weak group that had this thrust upon us. Guys, deep down, we know intuitively, instinctively, what it means to be a man, what it means to be masculine. And all it takes is just a conscious decision to be a positive masculine man, to be your version of an ideal man. Now, my ideal man is a warrior, a lover, a king, a hero a bold guardian, a maverick, a leader, a mentor, a visionary, an adventurer and explorer always pushing the boundaries, a man who lives with courage, honesty, integrity, a man who is committed to himself and to others, who has a sense of duty and honor, a man who loves deeply. Now, can they take any of that from me? Can they take my honesty? Can they take my boldness? Can someone come take my leadership or my sense of being a maverick or my sense of duty? They sure as hell can't take away my sense of adventure. The only way any of those go away is if I decide to give them up. They have no power or control here. I decide I'm a leader. I decide to be courageous. I decide to be honest and live in integrity. So this is not about waging a war against anything or fighting some enemy out there. It's only about what type of man you are and what the ideal positive masculine means to you. Because the only change is the change we make in ourselves. And when all of us decide to make that change, the change for the positive, and decide to commit to continually grow as men, to be better and better, to be that positive role model, to be that sovereign maverick, and to be leaders. When more and more of us are being our ideal masculine, and whatever that looks like to you, I don't expect you to tell me what my ideal masculine should be, and I'm not going to tell you what your ideal masculine should be. You know what's best for you. So when you are being your ideal man, and I am being my ideal man, and the men around the world are being their ideal men, the best men that they can be, that we can all be, that's when this all changes. So there's nothing to take back. It's simply a decision to be, that this is who I am. This is my ideal masculine, and I am being it right now, every day. Own it, be it. And no one can take it from you. And that brings us to today's guest. Because no one understands being your own man, no matter what anyone says, more than he does. He is the star of one of the original reality shows, American Chopper. And honestly, he needs no more of an introduction than that. Today we have Paul Tuttle Sr., founder of Orange County Choppers, a man famous for his big personality, his my way or the highway attitude, and of course, he's famous for the constant yelling. Many fans of the show have differing opinions about Paul Sr.'s personality. They think he's a loud mouth, he's a bully, he's an overly demanding asshole. And listen, honestly, as a fan of the show for years, I admit that I saw Paul Sr. as many of those while I was watching. But then I learned about a different side to him. See, a while back, my brother Ron 
he met Paul Sr.'s son, Mikey, and they became friends. Through Mikey, Ron met Paul Sr. and his girlfriend, Joni, and they all became close. And Ron would tell me stories about Paul, about how he is in real life, about his passion, his drive, his love for his family. So I wanted to get to know the real Paul Sr. myself. I wanted to understand this man who had one of the most successful reality TV series in history, a man who built an empire around building custom bikes. I wanted to understand how he became the man I watched yell and scream on TV all those years. Paul Sr. agreed to come on and tell us his story. I started by asking him about his love of motorcycles and what got him started building them. I was involved, involved with bikes probably in the, in the later part of the 60s, but truly involved like with fabrication and stuff in the early 70s. What got you going? What, what was that, that that made that happen? Now, I had a partner that was with me in the iron business, which, you know, I had the business for like 30-something years before the bike business. But um, but he was really a bike guy, like a real deal bike guy as far as building his bike from the ground up. And, you know, we always had the welders and the torches and stuff that pe other people didn't have. So I watched him build like a custom bike from the ground up. And that's pretty much where, that's pretty much where it started. And then in 1973, I, I bought my first uh, Harley. Mm -hmm. I still have it. 1974, I, I bought my first Harley. And I still have it. Still have it. What kind of shape's it in? It's it's uh, like it came out of a showcase window. Oh, it's beautiful. Probably has probably has about maybe three thousand miles on it. It's it's like a museum piece in my shop. When Paul Senior tells me this, my first thought is it seemed a bit obsessive, keeping a motorcycle in pristine condition for forty five years and rarely riding it. It reminded me of the 67 Corvette my dad had when I was growing up that he kept in the garage and barely drove and uh, wouldn't let my brother and I near. But as you hear Paul Sr.'s story and learn about the man he is, a man driven to perfection and excellence, a man who had to fight for everything he has, you'll understand why, of course, he still has his first Harley and of course he keeps it in pristine condition. I asked if he's always had a passion for building things and for working with his hands. Pretty much all my life, yeah. Always, uh, always work my hands, and even at a, even at an early age, that's, I knew that was my future. Really? Well, what were you building when you were younger? If it wasn't bikes? Yeah, it, you know, really, to be honest with you, it started with, uh, with uh, car models. Oh yeah. You mean like the plastic kits? Yeah, I, yeah. That you know, what I would do um, car models, but back then. You know, when you did car models back then, you, you had to, it wasn't like just putting a body on them and gluing a hood on it. It was, you had to, you had to do every individual piece, including the motor. So you had to glue the valve covers on, you had to, you know, put all the suspension together. It was quite a bit of mechanical ability, even to build a model um, back then. And then, you know, you would spray it like candy apple red or, or whatever. So you know, the process was, you know, from the from the beginning to the start, you kind of like started with nothing and then you, you, you ended up with, uh, you know, a nice finished piece. And basically we do the same thing today. I always knew that I, I wasn't going to be too successful in high school. And I never had and I had never had a vision about going to college, not even not even a thought. So I barely got out of high school. And, uh, you know, I knew that the only way that I probably survived is by you know, doing something creative or something with my, with my hands, you know. Paul made the decision at a young age that building and creating would be his future. I wanted to know if anyone in his family had guided him in this decision, if anyone had mentored and encouraged his creativity. Paul Sr. opened up and got honest and real about his childhood, about the family he grew up in and the impact it had on his life. He told me about his uncle, a man who was his role model, but may not have looked like one on the surface. I didn't really have any, like, uh, like the family I came from was very dysfunctional, so there was no, it was actually kind of like never having parents. The relationship between my parents was never, uh, never really a good relationship, and so I had four sisters. So it was, it wasn't, you know, growing up was not a good experience uh, for none of us. Um, but um, I did have a, 
uh, a role model, which was my uncle, which was my father's brother, who was an alcoholic and a gambler. But the thing of it is, is that he, like he would, he would uh, move in with us because he got thrown out or wherever he was. And, uh, but, but he would, uh, he's the guy that would build models with me and uh, spend some time with me. Um, whereas if my father or my mother would never do that. So I, I guess you could say he was my first role model. But you also said he was an alcoholic and a gambler. So was that kind of, were you not exposed to that as much when he was around you or? Well, you know, I was not exposed too much of him drinking because he didn't drink in the house. Uh, but there was always, you know, there was always some kind of uh, um, insanity going on because, you know, the bookies were looking for him and, you know, he used to get drunk and uh, actually one time he, uh, he actually crashed his car in front of our house. So, you know, everybody knew he had a problem, you know, at that, at that time, you know, like you don't, you know, as a young person, you don't really know, like, you don't really, you don't really get it. But, um, yeah, he, uh, he always, he always spent a lot of time with me, which is, that was the only person, but eventually, uh, the bookies were chasing him and he had too much to drink and, uh, he flipped the car over and that was the end of that. Paul was pretty matter of fact about the death of his uncle. I asked him how he felt about it. And he told me in his family, you didn't share feelings, you suppress them or you dealt with them in other ways. I got involved in drugs and alcohol at an early age and, you know, that continued into my marriage and, uh, so, you know, there's always dysfunction with that. Did I create the same environment that I had at home? No, I didn't. I think I learned what, you know, some of the stuff, um, what not to do. But, you know, when you're an alcoholic and a drug addict, you really don't have complete control of, of anything. Your feelings, your, you know, emotions doesn't, you know. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on. That's not healthy, but I got sober in 1985, and I think my son Paul was seven at the time. So all the kids, and he's the oldest, so all the kids really, they didn't really get to really experience the drinking era. Uh, Paulie did a bit, but but after that, it was pretty much you know uh, changing your life around, and uh, I got involved in a 12-step program. In 1985, I've been sober since then. Fantastic. That's great. And how has that changed since in the family life and in your relationships? Well, listen, you know, you, in order to be sober, you have to not just stop drinking. You have to change your life around. That doesn't happen overnight, but, you know, eventually, <laughs> eventually you start looking at people that are somewhat normal and how they function and I, and and I, I just think that uh, it gives you clarity and um, I think it allows you to do the things that you thought were right but were unable to do it. Paul senior turned his life around but not all the relationships healed. If you've watched the show you know a big part of the drama is the friction between Paul senior and his son Paul Jr. I wanted to know if that was manufactured by the producers of the show or if the pressures of the show caused the stress between the two of them. Paul Sr. got real about their relationship. We never really had a good relationship, way, even way before the show. And so there was always that love-hate relationship. You know, of course, the, the show compounded many times over. So there was a lot of damage done. And, you know, so even today, we have somewhat of a relationship. We go out to dinner once in a while, but I'm not so sure if it would ever be anything but, but that. Uh, and that's because there was so much damage done. Yeah. Damage how? What was the, the damage that was done? Well, part of the damage was my fault because I, you know, I tried to give them uh, everything that I didn't have. And that was my biggest mistake because it, it enabled them, and when you enable somebody, then they become titled, entitled. And I think that at an early age, especially 
uh, when we did the show because there was a lot of money flying around. You know, he always felt that, you know, he was entitled to, I think at some points more than more than I was entitled to. And, you know, I had already ran a business for 30 some odd years but previous to that. You know, Paul never owned, never had a job actually in his life. He just worked for me and that was it. So, you know, when you don't have life's experience, what do you have? You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like people are made up of history. And I think that, you know, you, when I was 18 years old, I was in, in the merchant Marines out on a ship and, you know, move, going around the world. And I was always out on my own. So, and I was always in my business. So that's a world by itself. You know what I mean? That's like, you survive or you don't survive, you know what I mean? And, and, and if you're going to survive, you have to do anything that you can to do that. So you're always in positions in life where you got to make choices and, and, you know, figure out stuff on your own because there, for me, there was never anybody there to say, well, maybe if you did this or here's a few dollars to do that. So that's where I think I overcompensated. And I think that it got to the point where, um, you know, he thought everything was okay. You know, I could come in late. I can come in early. I can do you know, pretty much what I want to do because I'm the boss's son. And in my mind, I never was like that. You know, I went to work at five o'clock in the morning, you know, and ran a business and people and had really, you know, my, my uh, ethics and my values for work were very important. You know, my uh, vision was him kind of taking over the business and running the business while I was there. But, you know, when you come in at 10 o'clock and you leave at three o'clock, you're not too much of a power example to the people that work underneath you. How often have we seen this? A father who fought for everything he had, who built himself up from nothing and created a thriving and highly successful business. And he wants to make sure his children have more than he did so they don't have to struggle like he did. This is perfectly noble, but of course there are expectations that come with that. The father expects the same work ethic and the same drive. But how could the son have that if they didn't experience what he did or face the challenges he faced? And then on the other side, from the son, there's a sense of entitlement, having been given a kingdom without having fought the battles and faced the challenges to earn it, without having gained the wisdom and experience necessary to be a good king, but yet still looking for acknowledgement from his father for the things that he has done. With these two opposing viewpoints, these two opposing life experiences, the situation escalates. I think that was one of our biggest issues um, was, you know, him expecting more for less. You know, and then it got then it got really ugly, and then there was a lawsuit. And, you know, people people still think to today that I sued him, but in in reality. He, I had given him 20% of my business and, uh, you know, when things got, got bad there um, and he kind of went on his own, you know, I, it kind of paralyzed me from moving to do the things that I wanted to move forward with because he had 20% of the business. So then he had sued me for a million dollars again because he thought he was entitled to that money. And, and he, you know, he wound up taking a, a million, a million three from me kind of out of my own pocket. So, you know, and on and on and on, I don't want to get into, I can get, I can go on forever, but you know, if you think about a father and son relationship and your father and your son who had made millions of dollars because of me and then sues you for a million plus, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a hard thing to get by. And, and, and I think that, you know, it kind of needs to be somewhat of a two way street and uh, it's really never been that way. So, you know, at some point you just, you, you come to the realization that it's not going to be the same. And listen, I love my son. You know, I, I, you know, he's, he's my son. I'll always love him, but I don't like him. This statement hit me like a knife in my heart. I'll always love him, but I don't like him. Whew, man, the, the, the power and emotion of that statement. If I'm being honest, I felt this way about members of my own family but I never had the balls to ever admit it. To say this about your own son takes a strength, courage, uh, a brutal honesty. Love is brutal. Love is the most devastating emotion. Sometimes love can mean having powerful feeling for someone you really don't like. 
And sometimes love means letting them go. I guess you want the, the best for your, for your children. And you hope that, that you, you know, you're, that you're somewhat of an example in their life. And when you continue to go back into relationships to try and make them better, at some point, and that's what happened to me, at some point, I had to come to the realization that as much as I wanted it to change, it was not going to change. And I think at that point, I said, you know, insanity is repeating the same action and expecting different results. And I just came to the realization that, you know, it's not going to happen. So I kind of, you know, let him go his own way and, you know, and, 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 you know, just kind of let go and of that to let him live his own life, you know? And, and, and I kind of felt that, 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 that even to today, it, it never really happened, you know, because, uh, you know, if you look at, at even like the last shows and stuff like that, there was a lot of animosity on, on both of our parts. But I kind of feel that I believed in what I did and I still do it today. You know what I mean? It's a passion. It's a love. I'm 70 years old and I don't see no reason for re retirement, maybe forever till I can't stop anymore because, you know, I kind of enjoy what I do. <laughs> some, some parts of it, some parts of it, I don't. <laughs> I kind of feel, and I don't want to make this whole session on Paul Jr., but, you know, I, I, I kind of feel that, like, he, he rode my coattail, and he still rides my coattail. And I guess, and you know, at some point, you need to develop your own identity. You, you can't live in somebody's shadow forever. So it's kind of like if nothing changes, nothing changes, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's something that he would have to come to terms with uh, if he ever does come to terms with yeah, you know what I'm feeling around, Paul, when you say that is um, it's like I can get you to a certain point, And at that point, you've got to challenge yourself and start to grow on your own. Like I got you to here. Now it's time for you to stand up as your own man, grow as your own man, become your own man. You know, I may not always be there for you. Right. This is push out of the nest. Time to fly. Yeah. And, and you know, it's not like like, I don't really tell everybody my story. You know, when you, when, if you go back to childhood and stuff like that, it's pretty painful. But he knows, he knows a lot of my story. You know, just through the years, you, you talk about, you know, how you grew up and, you know, like, who's grandpa, you know? And you, so I grew up by myself, okay? And everything that I did or anything I earned, I did it myself. So... Sometimes I couldn't get the conception of, okay, so you understand where I came from, okay? And you understand, you know, where I am now from perseverance. So you would hope that he would, or anybody would, would you know, look at that and say, okay, here's this guy that went through all this adversity, you know, you know what have I done in my life? So I don't, it's hard for me to get that conception of, you know, you're drawing on a drawing board, and <laughs> here's a picture. You know, if you need to know what part of picture is what, I'll explain it to you. You know what I mean? Sure. So it really comes down to an acceptance thing. You know what I mean? And, and eventually I did get to the point where, you know what, you know, I'm not changing this person, so I need to accept him the way he is. Yeah, and, and if you really look at it, Paul, I mean, my feel on it is you grew up differently, right? You had your childhood and how yeah. you grew up, he had his. Right. So you can't have yeah. the same expectation yeah. because you had two very different childhoods. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You can feel the pain of Paul Sr.'s past and his not wanting his son to go through the same pain. That is a father's love. But our experiences make us who we are. The challenges you faced or didn't have to face make you the man you are today. For some of us, and myself included, there was a path from weakness to strength, a growth from dependence to independence. I had to fight for my strength. For some men, they were born with a sense of sovereignty and independence right from the beginning. Paul Sr. is a fiercely independent man with a strong trust in himself. He's a no bullshit, take it or leave it kind of guy. I wanted to know if he was always this way or if it was something that evolved over time. I think I've been like that all my life because really... I kind of had to be that way in order to survive. 
probably in the last five, six, seven years or whatever, I think my mentality has changed on that and allowed more people like Joan into my life that allowed me to <laughs> to see things differently. So that's a learning experience. <laughs> that's a learning experience by itself, you know, because <laughs> really, you know, I'm, I'm a, um, like a caveman, you know what I mean? I'm really, I'm, you can consider me a caveman because, you know, I, I have <clears throat> certain ways of doing things. And, and listen, you know, when my era of business, you know, when I was in my, you know, I opened my own steel business when I was, I don't know, 22, 23, somewhere around there. And that's when things were tough. You know what I mean? You didn't, you didn't uh, say I'm getting my lawyer on you. You know what I mean? It was, you know, you went to job meetings and people were fist fighting, you know what I mean? So it's you, you, you know, you had to, you had to yell the loudest to get the most. So that's the environment I came from. That's the life I live. So it's hard to, convert to today's where everything is like oh okay you know what i mean we'll work it out we'll do this you know what i mean well in my day you punch somebody in the face you know what i mean or you went in his office and you dragged him out of his office or you went in there you're demanding your money that's the way that that's the way i grew up that's the way that i survived survived in the business world and that's the only way in the construction business and in the welding business that you could survive so you know you have that mentality that carries over for many years and in, into you know uh okay so you're not doing a steel business anymore you're doing a motorcycle business you still have that type of mentality you know and it's kind of like when i look at it today it's not so uh there's better ways i think that for me i always resort back from time to time because i think that's what i know best but i do realize that there's uh better ways to do things but when when it, when it comes down to the trenches, okay, I get back I get back down into the mud. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm not a diplomatic person, and yeah. um, I don't think I'll, I'll ever be. You know what I mean? So it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't matter if I'm talking to the president of the United States or whoever it is. If they piss me off and they they rub me the wrong way, they're not going to get the answers, or they're not going to get the person that they may think I am. So you're a fighter at heart. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, you're a fighter more than a diplomat. Yes. Yes, by far. And, yeah. and again, you know, today that doesn't work as well as it did back in the day. You know, back in the day, it was, like I said, you know, there was no, you know, I'm not suing, you know, nobody, it wasn't really a lot, lot, lot of like lawsuits and stuff like that. You had a fight, you know what I mean? People always wanted to keep your money and you, you know, it was your money. And you earned it and, you know, you were going to figure out how to get your money back. So it's, a, it's, it, 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 listen, life's, life's a journey. You know what I mean? And I think that you never, you're never in the same spot, you know? And I think that people, I think people see your, your past and they think that that's what your presence is now. If you, if you follow what I'm saying, I think that you always have to, you know, remember where you came from. And, and, I, and I think you need to be humble and to you know, stay true to who you are, you know. And I think that if you watch the show right from the beginning, it was pretty obvious. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> obvious that I wasn't bullshit and, and that I was being who I am in everyday life, not just for TV. Paul Sr. was being who he is in everyday life, but who people thought he was was different depending on their perspective. Years ago, when I watched the show, I had a perception of him as this raging asshole who you could never please, and I wasn't alone in that. When I told people he was going to be a guest on the show, they would ask me, isn't he that guy that yells all the time? Because the yelling is Paul Sr.'s trademark, and he doesn't deny he yells a lot. It's part of who he is in everyday life. It's just him being real. And the more I learned about Paul's life and background, the less the yelling felt like it was coming from anger. I asked if it was more of an expression of his passion and his drive for excellence. So tell me about that, because to me, it's, it's passion and a drive for excellence that most people don't understand. Yeah, and I guess that's a defect that's at the same time, you know what I mean? Because, you know, it's, it, it's like nothing's good enough for me. Like when I do something, you know, I always say to myself that, you know, maybe that could have been better, you know? Or if I'm building a bike, it has to be perfection. So I guess that 
you expect that from other people. And I think that's, that's a set that's setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. But I also, I get that the flip side of that is pushing people to be excellent themselves and not letting them fall back on just being okay. I think there's a duty to that also. Yeah. Yes. And I think that not a hundred percent, but that comes by, by being a power of example. Now I may be that guy that's yelling all the time, but if you really go back and let's go back to the video, most of the times I'm just not yelling to listen to myself yell. Usually there's a reason for that, you know, and I, my expectations are high. So the people that work for me, I had high expectations for them. And if they, if they couldn't fulfill those expectations, then they weren't there no more. So if you look at the crew that I had, they were all good people. They had good ethics. They wanted to be there and they wanted to do the job that I wanted them to do. So, you know, when you get to the point where you got to just keep forcing per people and you got to say, <clears throat> that bolt's crooked. Why is that bolt crooked? You know, if I'm a perfectionist, okay, then that's what, that's pretty much what I accept. I agree. I mean, you know, and, and it comes down to, like I said earlier, if you just keep allowing it, it slides down and down and down. There, there's something to be said for challenging your people, keeping them on their toes, keeping them pushing towards excellence. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that, you know, when it comes down to being real, like you're like, nothing's beneath me. You know, if I got to go and clean the toilet bowl, I'm going to go clean the toilet bowl. You know what I mean? So I kind of feel that I'm not so much above other than, you know, I, I am, but above every body or above doing certain things because of who I am. And I think people appreciate that too. Oh, I agree. I think they do as well. I mean, you know, there's a big difference between the guy who just comes into the room and yells and screams and barks out orders and the guy who comes in, you know, because he's the boss and because he has the authority to do so versus the guy who comes in and yells and screams because he's truly passionate about what he's doing. He's demanding excellence from the people that he's, you know, in charge of, and he's also willing to get in there and do it himself. And if they know that, that he's willing to lead from the front, as they say, that's a huge difference between um, being passionate and being an asshole. <laughs> well spoken. Well spoken. <laughs> yeah. Paul Sr. is passionate about more than just building bikes. Since the beginning of American Chopper's success, he has been a loyal supporter of dozens of charities. The ones he's most passionate about are centered around military veterans, children, and animals. He told me when he first realized the power and impact his celebrity held and the duty he felt to use that power to help others. I think that's a learning experience and a growth experience, too, because when you first start off in the, in the filming and the, the show, that takes a while to figure out because you're a guy that just was a blue-collar guy, <clears throat> didn't really take, want to even take his picture taken with a camera, uh, and now all of a sudden you're in front of three million people. You know, when you work hard all your life and your goal is, you know, you want to live comfortably, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden you get into this situation where now you're making a lot of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now you're making a lot of money. So you're, you, I think you get absorbed in, okay, you know, what could I do with this money? You know, and you're, uh, and you're involved in a lot of different things. And for me, it's, it, it was a very mind boggling to me how the, I guess the world fell in love with us, you know, because I always uh, visualize as there was this maniac, you know what I mean? There's this crazy guy with this crazy family who would want anything to do with these people. <laughs> you know, when you, when you really think about it, cause it really, it's true. It's like these, these people are crazy, especially me. And then one day, um, the, uh, somebody came upstairs and said, uh, there's a, a bunch of kids downstairs that want to see you. And I was like, well, why would there be, especially kids, why would there be kids here? Um, so anyhow, I go downstairs, and it's a busload of kids from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And they're all, they're all kids, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> and they all got Orange County Chopper gear on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think I could figure that out. But I think that was the beginning of realizing how important it is to give back. Yeah. Tell me about that day when those kids came in. So what did they do? They want to sit on the bikes. They want to 
autograph? I mean, what did they want to put bolts through and, you know, screw in some of the parts? What, what were they looking to do? You know what? They were looking to hang out. They were looking to hang out. I mean, it led into, like, even today, we do big events, Make-A-Wish. We were Make-A-Wish of the Year in 205. We were picked over <laughs> We were picked over Disney World. That's crazy. <laughs> that says something, too, Paul, when uh, kids would rather go play with you in the motorcycles than go play with Mickey. <laughs> crazy. But, you know, the, the day those kids came there and they, they hung out and, and it just felt real – like I felt real comfortable with them. I'm kind of like a kid myself, so I could get down to that level. So we just had conversations. We had lunch. And I think that it was just a big uh, turning point in my life that it wasn't all about money, but it was the power that I had to be able to make those differences. When you realize that you have that much power to make those changes, not just in make a wish, but the other 50 foundations and military that we support, I, you know, I think that's like today, that's the most important thing, you know, giving back. Giving back, not just to those kids, but to his own inner kid. Looking at Paul Sr.'s childhood and his lack of a role model, his lack of a strong male presence in his life, it's why he connects to these kids so powerfully and why it's such a real, genuine connection. And it's why Paul Sr. is passionate about being that strong male role model they need. It's the one he needed when he was young. A warrior and a king his whole life, this has allowed him to tap into his lover and hero, his emotional side, and the side that comes from purpose and duty to others. I like dealing with uh, mentally challenged people uh, most. And and it, it amazes me that these kids or adults could come into my shop and see me and really know who I am and really, really, really get excited. It's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, it's it's emotional, isn't it? I mean, it's a powerful experience. It really is. It really is. So for me, it's like, you know, I'm into animals big time, especially dogs, kids, and, you know, mentally challenged people is probably my favorite people to be around. Tell me about that. Why? Why why the mentally challenged people? Why are they why do you feel such a connection there? Because sometimes I feel, you know, like I think that um, you know, their ever daily their life is is different, you know. Um and so, you know, for you know, when you see these people would be kids or adults light up the way that they do, it's just a, a you know, it's just a heartfelt you know, it's, it, it's, for me, it's just, um, yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. It's just, yeah, it's emotional. Sometimes it's tough to put into words. Like it's just that feeling right here that something special has happened. Yeah. And, and you know, you, uh, you know I, I don't uh, analyze what that is. I, I, I react to it. I don't intellectualize, like, what this is about. Now I'm just happy to see them. It, it, it's a heart, it's a heart, uh, heart medicine, you know? It's like when they, I light up when I see animals, when I see kids, you know, adults, (laughs) (laughs) so-so. I appreciate, I I have such a fan base. It's like in in 160 countries that it's, that blows my mind. It really blows my mind. People love us. You know what I mean? They truly, they'll line up for hours to, to, to see me. You know what I mean? So I really appreciate I appreciate that too. And I think that part of my success is from, you know, all the fans supporting. So I'm grateful for that too. You know, and I think a big part of that, Paul, when I really put my attention on it is going back to what you just said, is I really feel that they feel your heart and your passion because you are coming from being genuine and coming from your heart rather than, like you said, intellectualizing it. And I think these people can feel that. And I think that the fans that you have can feel that, that this is a real guy and he's coming from his heart. He doesn't give a shit if you like him or not, if you like what he says or not, or how he says it or not, this is who I am. And when you really have that love and appreciation for people, they feel that and they have that love and appreciation for you. I totally agree with that, you know, and and like, there's a thing with animals, you know, like I kind of gauge people sometimes on animals or what their feelings are towards animals, or even 
you know, sometimes I could, I could sense a dog being around a person. I could almost sense whether that person is a good person or not a good person by the way the dog reacts. So even in that world, you know, me and Joni are very active in that world. And uh, it seems like um, I could probably walk up to 90% of the dogs that are, would bite most people. And I think that's because they realize that I'm, that I'm not there to harm them and that I care. Yeah, they can definitely feel the heart, Paul. I mean, that's, that's exactly what it is. Um, I'm also feeling, and just, I don't know, need to say, when you said that um, the, 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 who really hits you the hardest, children, dogs, animals, people with special needs, to me, that, that translates to they're the innocents, right? That's the pure innocence of children, of animals, of mentally challenged. They also only come from the heart. They don't have ulterior motives. They don't have agendas. They're just coming purely from there. They're the innocents. Absolutely. Yeah. Besides children and animals, Paul Sr. has been a longtime supporter of our military. The series' most watched episode centered around the build of a POW tribute bike. It's still the bike fans talk about more than any other. I asked him what inspired him to build it. It's always been patriotic. And, you know, if you really think about what these people do to protect their country, it's a lot, you know what I mean? And I think that it's kind of the same thing in a sense, you know what I mean? It's, it kind of comes from your heart. I think the first time we really, really got involved was when I built the POW bike. And that was one of your first tribute bikes, wasn't it? It was the first tribute bike. Yeah. And... And up to still to today, it uh, people will never forget that, and people will always appreciate that. Still to today, I think that to give back to the military that are constantly giving back is, I guess, maybe just a, a token of appreciation. You know, we have a, the military base by us, Stuart. It just seems like we're building bike after bike for raise money for different. You know, we just did a bike for EOD. So you know, of course, there's different branches. Uh, of the military and so i don't know it just seems like uh like you can't do enough they can't do en enough for our country you know what i'm saying so in return i kind of feel that way i'm from the vietnam era i i felt that those people that came back from war were not treated well at all and so i think a lot of people forget and a lot of people forgot so i just kind of felt it in my heart that they deserve some recognition for what they did. And that's pretty much the reason why I did the first bike, which was the POW bike. I'm looking back. You've, you started the OCC Foundation, correct? Back in 2010? Yes. And it looks like you've been doing this charity work regardless of your financial situation. Like this is just, you give back anyway. This is not a I have a lot of money, I'm going to give back. This is really coming from a sense of passion and wanting to pay back or pay forward. Yeah, you, you, you got that right. You know, I think that once, I guess, awakening, when those kids came in, I think that was the beginning and it hasn't stopped. Here's the lover and hero archetypes again. Once Paul Sr.'s heart opened, he couldn't turn it off and he found purpose in giving back not just to organizations, but to individuals as well. I think as long as we keep doing what we're doing, we, we're, we will keep doing that, which yeah. is giving back, whether it's to organizations, uh, whatever it may be, even individuals. The rewarding things are not money. I'll give you an example, which, which I thought was um, kind of in the beginning there. I went into a, a, a place to get a part. And the guy was in there, and I don't know who the guy was, and he said to me that his wife had stage four cancer. And she said her bucket list was to go for a ride on my bike with me. That was her bucket list. I never met the guy. I don't know who he was. I said, uh, well, where do you live? So he told me where he lived, and I said, well, I'll be there Saturday. So I went there, and I gave her a ride uh, on the bike. And um, she passed shortly after that. But... To me, that was like an honor to do that. Yeah, I can feel that. And I can feel the, you know, a lot of us, and I know this, this goes for me included, feel like, oh, when I get to this, I'll start giving back. When I have this much, 
I'll start giving back. When I reach this whatever, I'll start giving back because you're thinking grand scale, right? And that's an example of just, you know, one-on-one. Well, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's what you're saying. And, and I mean, I could have said the guy that, you know, let me, let me see if I get a chance, I'll be over here. It wasn't that, you know I mean? It was, I was going to be there. I don't know you. I don't know your wife. I don't, I don't really care. I'm going there to do this because it's in my heart to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's beautiful. And it, it is, it's an example of little things make huge, huge differences right? Enormous differences. And it's not anything that was publicized or had, you know, cameras around when you were doing it. It was just that one act. And then another time, <laughs> there's so many stories and I, I don't, you know. I no, tell me. I want to hear them. Tell me. But um, Joni knew this guy. She was going back and forth um, on Facebook with this gentleman who had cancer. Some people are such huge fans that you can't, they're, they're, I mean, I have people shake, I have people cry, even guys, you know? So he's, again, this is one of those situations where before he died, he, that would be, like to him, that would be the ultimate thing to, to be able to meet me. And he lived like four hours, I think it was four hours or so away, right? Somewhere. So John said, let's take a ride down there. And I was like, yeah, you're crazy. You know what I mean? It's, it's because everybody asks you that, you know, and you can't fulfill every even though you'd like to you just can't you know so i said you know what he was having a party his birthday or whatever it was so i said all right let's do it so we drive four hours and we never told him we were coming (laughs) so when we walked into that party it was like the the place kind of like shut down because everybody was like in awe it made such an impact in this guy Bill's life that I don't, you know, I don't really know that feeling because I've never had it in my, in my life, but I could just, I could just imagine, you know, and, and, and he got to come to my shop, which was one of his other wishes, and, and he passed away the following day. So at, at least he got, I guess, something that was valued to him. Yeah. And for us, for us too. Well, that was my next question. I was going to say, what, you know, tell me what, what you're getting out of that, how that's changed your life just from being able to do things like this. What, what, are, what are you getting out of it? I don't mean getting out of it in a selfish way, but how does it impact you in your life? Uh, you know, it's the best part. It's the best part. It's the best part. You know what I mean? You know, when you go to bed at night, you know, you could be thinking about, you know, whatever it is, but when you go to bed at night and you realize that you made that difference in that person's life, you know what I mean? It doesn't get, it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't get much better, you know? And, 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 and I could go, I can go on and on and on about situations like that. Those are big experiences in my life. Yeah. I would think you know, with the money, the fame, the success, all of that, to have those moments be the biggest part of your life is pretty, pretty powerful. You know, I feel in my life that I've been around and I've done a lot. I could never explain my life and, I, and what I've done in my life in, in a lifetime. And I, I always um, say that that's what life is made up of. Life is made up of your history, where you've been, what have you done, what can you say, who can, you know, what could you tell people? You know, and otherwise you have nothing. If you don't have a story, you have nothing. What, what I do sometimes in, is, is I put a notch on my belt. I don't physically put a notch on my belt. But I add that to the collection of things that I've accomplished. So every time that there's a situation, whether it be Bill or whoever that be, it's another notch on my belt. And I don't mean that in a sense like, look at me or, you know what I'm saying? For, but it's important for me in my life. Oh, I think, yeah. And I, and I agree. And I think it's important for all of us. Well, you know, at some point somewhere there, you know, those who believe we're going to have to face karma, creator, the universe, whatever you want to call it, and really show what we've done, what we've accomplished in life. And, and I, I know it's not the size of the bank account. I know it's those notches on the belt that are really what matter. Yeah, and I think that, I think there's a lot of stuff that people do and they're what I call a look at me kind of deal. You know what I mean? So Self-serving, they're they're just really being self-serving at that point. Yeah. You see that quite a bit, you know, but I, but I think that's, 
it's very obvious. Yeah. Well, it's like you said, you can tell from the dogs, you know who they're going to bite and who they're not going to bite. It's the same thing with people. You know who's doing it for their own self-interest and you know who's doing it coming from passion, from the heart. Absolutely. I wanted to know about the women in Paul Sr.'s life. We know he didn't have strong male role models in his life and not a lot of masculine support. His longtime girlfriend, Joni, is a strong, successful woman who's by his side all the time. I asked if there were other women who helped shape who he is. I honestly haven't really had strong women around my life. Other than Joan, you know, when I look back, it's always, out, you know, because of my strong personality. Listen, I, I did a lot of the things for the wrong reasons. Coming from where I came from, I had a, a, a mother that abused my father. So what respect did I learn at that age about women? that pretty much carried out through a large portion of my life because that's what I seen growing up. So, so it, 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 it became, I guess you can say a disrespect for a woman, for, for, for women in my life. And I was married twice, but again, you know, you go through stages of life, you go through the alcohols and you go through the drugs, you know, and, and, and all that stuff. And then I think the, I think that trying to find out what love is, is something that for me, I figured that out way later in life. And I think that I figured out what was more important in a relationship. Because for me, it was sex. That's the thing that was my big thing was sex, you know, and that was love. That was, that was whatever, you know, you know what I'm saying? That, yeah. That if, me, if, I, the, if the sex was good, the relationship was good, right? That's, you know, a lot of us yeah. went through that. That's a, kind of an immature male way of thinking, right? The sex is amazing. She's amazing. Yeah, but it's short-lived. It's short-lived. So I think, with, I think where I am now, or where I've come to with Joni when I met her, like I couldn't, it's another thing I couldn't figure out why I was so in love with this person. I couldn't figure it out. You know, I remember sitting down eating lunch with her and I said to her, you know, I don't know why I feel like this. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't usually feel like this, you know what I mean? I, I've been married twice. I had hundreds of girlfriends, and I said, so I don't, I'm not getting this. I don't understand. And she said that that's because you, you're in love. <laughs> I said, <laughs> well, maybe. Because <laughs> I never would have thought of that, you know what I mean? What, 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 you know, what would possess me to think about that? I'd think about everything else but love because that's not the way I was brought up. Nobody said, I love you in my house. Never, never. It was always... You know, it was like uh, if you did if you didn't do something wrong, you got hit for it. Well, that's that. Well, that'll make up for the next time that you do something wrong. So, there the word love to, to you know that's that I guess is in a normal household. You you learn that as you as you grow up, or people that are in your life, you see that. You know what I mean? I never saw that. You know, it was just you know it was a battlefield, a bloody battlefield. So when she said that, it was like a light went off. <laughs> a light went off, you know what I mean? And I think that, oh, I'll get Joni's over here. <laughs> She's trying to feed me lines over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See? See what happens when you get in <laughs> love and you get that strong woman next to you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> that support, right. Paul. That's what they're there for. That's that yeah. beautiful, loving support. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're, when you have the background that I have and, you know, you're brought up the way that I am and going back to, so it's sex, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's what's number one. You don't, you don't really think about, well, you know, what else do you have in common? You know what I mean? Because the sex goes away and the relationship goes away after a while because that's what it's based on. And I think that, you know, the, the, the other thing that was there was like mentally stimulating, stimulating, you know what I mean? Like I never had, I never really could sit down with um, my exes and really get into a conversation. So I think that that was a big part of it too. Sure. So, so looking at the difference now, how, how different is your life now having a strong woman like Joni in your life? How has it helped you grow, affected you, changed you? Well, I, I guess going back to before when we talked about beating up people and, you know, at some point kind of changing your 
life, I think when she entered my life, things started, started changing in my life. She always had my best interest. Nobody else did. This is what happens when a king has a powerful queen in his life. There's a deeper level of love and trust, two things Paul Sr. has never felt before, and it's allowed his life to change in a positive way. It's opened his heart, fueled his passion, and when a man who has been a warrior and a king his entire life finds that love and passion and fully owns it, powerful things happen. I asked Paul Sr. what he felt his biggest accomplishment has been. And maybe I said it before, but I think it's been, and I say it all the time to people, is being able to change people's lives in a positive manner. I think that that's a, that's a gift. And, and, and I'll tell you a, a, another little, sometimes you're, you're, you're been through something 20 times, but then it, all of a sudden it, it registers, you know? So when I do appearances, there's usually a, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people. I could stand there and take pictures from sun up to sundown, you know? And sometimes it becomes like a burden. Like I look at it as, damn, I've been on my feet all day. I got to, you know what I mean? I need, I, I, I can't do this. You know what I mean? It's like I need, you know, and, and if you don't pay attention, uh, really pay attention because you just want time to go by. So I was stand. I was in Germany or Italy and that was at Mikey and we were up on stage or whatever. And people will come by and people will come by. And I realized that it's really not about me because it was the experience these people were having. Because they, you were making their day. It was more than just standing up there and giving an autograph or taking a picture. It was about the experience that these people were having. You know, when they came up there, they were shaking. When they came up there, uh, they were excited. You know what I mean? So it was like, it, it was just, it just, it just was kind of like going back to the kids when the kids came up. It was kind of like that awakening. Yeah. That it's more for them than you. I mean, that's, you know, we talk about warrior, lover, king, hero on the show. Hero is really someone who's kind of transcended their own need and doing for them. And it's all about doing for others. And it sounds like that's exactly what's happening in that case, right? This is, I'm here for them. I have... Because of my life, yeah. I have this ability to give back in that way. Absolutely. And I, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that, you know, wherever success comes from, it comes from to, to bring you up to that position in life. So I started out building bikes in my life. And then I started, um, you know, I was in a steel business. And then I said, you know, I love this so much that, I had a pretty good stash. I'm going to open up a little shop downstairs and I'm going to build maybe 10 bikes a year at most just, just for the passion of it, you know. Six months after that, I get a call from Discovery and that changed everything. So you kind of know, you never know where certain things are going to bring you in life. So you, you, you start out as, okay, I want to do something that I want to do. And then it goes into something else and it goes into something else. And then it brings you to where you are today. And it's kind of, like I said before, that whole process brings you to the point where you're able to do and make a difference in people's life. So I just think it's part of that journey. I have this saying today, I, I have this saying, and, and it is, you have to show up. Sometimes you just have to show up and life takes a turn or it makes a difference in your life or it makes you different to somebody else's life, but you have to show up. Paul Sr. definitely showed up and he keeps showing up, proving you can evolve and grow at any point in your life, proving even a lifelong fighter and tough guy, a warrior can open his heart and find love and find passion and purpose in helping others. One of the things I personally took away was how he demonstrated how you don't have to be a victim. As a man who grew up in the kind of family he had, it would have been very easy to say, you know, this is my life. This is the shit I was born into, so this is all there is for me. But he didn't do that. I know for me, early in my life, I used my childhood as an excuse for why things weren't the way I wanted them. Growing up raised by an overprotective single mother, um, the, the running joke is I was raised like a veal because I wasn't ever allowed to get bumped or bruised. 
so very overprotected. And, and I used that as an excuse for why I wasn't prepared to overcome a lot of the challenges that I faced, why I would fail at things. I made myself a victim of my upbringing when my outcome wasn't what I wanted. But Paul realized what many of us come to realize at some point in our lives. We can be more by deciding to be more. He knew he could be more than what his childhood showed him. It drove him, gave him purpose, and he ended up incredibly successful. I got some of the men of the round table together after talking to Paul. I let them hear the interview, and I got their impressions and takeaways from what he said. Here are just a few minutes of that discussion. To add a bit to what, you, what both of you shared, because I completely agree, and it's something I struggle with at times, and I try to remain aware of with my son and my daughter, is, is you know, focusing on giving them what you never had, opposed to focusing on teaching them what you never knew. And that's, that's kind of a simple way that I, and a simple, you know, quote that I keep in mind that, that helps me keep that focus. Um, Cause the other thing tied to that from Paul senior that stands out. I mean, I think by anyone's measure, his upbringing was extremely tough and that's not something anyone would want for their children. But at the same time, those extreme challenges are what made him who he is. Yeah. So it's like, Frank, the question is how, how do you, get that same experience for your kids without le- having to have them go through that. Right. Right. And that, and that's where that quote, again, a, v- a very simplified way to look at it, but that's keeping that in mind is what's helped me again. Yeah. Focus on teaching them what you didn't know, you know, to try to teach them those lessons opposed to just giving them what you didn't have. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, certainly you don't want your kids to go through any of those traumas, but you want to make sure that the lessons learned from going through that, they still, you know, are, are, are still instilled in them. Yeah. And, you know, like with Paul senior, I mean, very fortunate that, you know, he at least had the role model of his uncle, you know, while it wasn't what we would call, you know, ideal, but at least he had somebody who was giving him attention and inputting some value into his life. What really kind of got me was his, his just, commitment to that. And when I say that, what comes up is the part in the interview where he really kind of is exploring his feelings around his son. And he says like, yeah, I, I, I like him, you know, or, you know, I love him, but I really don't like him. And, and all that stuff he had to do to separate himself from there to stick to what he believed in. And, and that has got to be very difficult as much as you love your own son to be able to just say, you know what, I have to stick to myself and and do what's right for me, even though it's my son we're talking about here. And that just shows that level of commitment that is, is rare, I think in these days. Yeah, I'll jump in. And this one hit me a lot too, because I'll go through it myself. The more I've uh, transformed my own life, become a better man, those closest to me, I've also, it's brought a lot of hate also. It's brought a ton of hate. And it's taking a lot of fortitude and just saying, no, I know this is the right thing and sticking to my guns. And they come around and it's in waves and sometimes they love me and sometimes they hate me. But the only thing that doesn't waver is my own commitment to being a better person and a better man, being sovereign and being my true self all the time. And uh, it's, it's been a lesson to build that for myself too, as he has done. There's a great song by a country star called Paul, his name is Paul Thorne. He's got a country song. It says, I love all my family, but I only like half of them. <laughs> <laughs> when you, you become aware of all the things that he does with the kids, and what was really cool about it is he can show this soft side, you know, and he can be sensitive and he can be caring, but he never gives up his masculine persona. He never sacrifices his masculinity, and I think that's one of the – key things that I took from this is it's like so many times we feel if I'm going to be sensitive or I'm going to do stuff with kids and that, that I'm not being a real man. And I mean, and tell Paul senior, he's not a real man. (laughs) There were a lot more great insights from this round table discussion. So what I decided to do is I'm going to make it into an entire episode. So that's going to come out later this week. Make sure to look for that. Now, I want to know what you got out of Paul Sr.'s story. First, did it change your perception of who he is? And did it change your perception of who you are and who you can be? Do you have a new perspective on your warrior and your lover? 
Let me know, guys. I want to hear. You can find me on social media. Real easy to find me. The links are in the website. That's WLKHpodcast.com. Again, WLKHpodcast.com. Head over there and uh, leave me a comment. Let me know what's going on with you. Also, remember to rate us and leave a review and comment here if you like the show. And most importantly, make sure to share this show with men you know will get value and benefit out of it. So please pass it on. I want to thank Paul Sr. for joining us today, for being real and honest, and for telling us the story of his journey to modern manhood. And I want to thank you for listening to Eric Rogel Talks with Warriors, Lovers, Kings, and Heroes today. I'm Eric Rogel, and I'm honored to be with you, to be your brother on your hero's journey. I'll talk to you next week.